How do you teach issues such as human rights without traumatization or, or great traumatization? You don't want to, you know, have these kids have nightmares. On the other hand, you want them to know um, history and uh, what's right and what's wrong. And uh, I think that's really a challenge for us all. Uh, how do we introduce uh, a subject such as this uh, in, in a way that maybe in increments as they get older and each year you can do a little more uh, with, with the subject. And um, since you do do a lot of immigration and, and geography, there are just a lot of things that are rushing to my mind now. One is that probably all of you have Armenian kids in your classrooms, or most of you do. And, um, uh, and I think back, you know, do we realize really how um, difficult it is for a lot of these kids? They have um, probably the children of immigrants, and, or may they, they may be immigrants themselves, uh, or at least their grandparents came here as immigrants. And they had, like probably I had, a lot of identity issues of, you know, who am I? Um, how do I become accepted uh, into the mainstream of uh, society here? Um, I, I remember when I was in uh, elementary school, fifth and sixth grade, in Tulare, I always had to cringe because when they called the roll and got to my name, my long last name, I knew they were going to sort of stop and, and, and um, fumble over my name. And already I was, you know, causing me, causing me certain issues of who, what am I and what do I want to be. And I think a, a lot of the youngsters here in Glendale, La Canada, are probably in that way they're living dual existences. In the home they're something else and then when they come to school and out the door into the playground they become other kids in different ways and in English speaking and going back to Armenian speaking home. So all of these are, are really complicated um, and we come, I think we really have to be sensitive uh, to this and to their own struggle. Uh, I struggled a long time to uh, um, not feel, um, put it this way, to, become, to feel comfortable with who I was. Um, at first I um, sort of rejected who I was. I wanted to become Anglo and you know, uh, California in the United States is still quite racist, but in my years, uh, nearly a century ago, it was extremely racist, and uh, anything that smacked of foreignness was not acceptable. And we were under enormous pressure, enor enormous pressure to conform, to be like the mainstream. And if we weren't like it, to try to get there, to try to get there as quickly as possible. And, and therefore, immigrants of my generation, and may be true today as well, sort of rejected um, the old culture. Uh, we rejected the old language. Um, we rejected our own parents' trauma and experiences, even though we knew uh, what they had been through. And I'm speaking for myself. There are others who don't feel like I, uh, I feel uh, I know. So we were, uh, uh, we were, without even being told, uh, trying to become Anglo, uh, trying to become white as possible, uh, uh, to be, uh, uh, to be uh, accepted. Uh, and I lived very close to um, prejudice, close to prejudice and wanting to avoid prejudice. And I say close to prejudice because the major city in the San Joaquin Valley is Fresno. 
And wherever a large number of any ethnic group concentrates, there's going to be a lot of prejudice. And I'm sure there's a lot of prejudice here in Glendale relating to Armenians because there are a significant number of people here and you pick out the things you don't like about them and it's not difficult to uh, have this negative, uh, a negative sense to them. So a large number of Armenians came uh, to Fresno and if you're going to be doing immigrant history or immigration history, it would be really an interesting place to study uh, the San Joaquin Valley. Uh, and because they came in large numbers uh, and concentrated in certain quarters, there, uh, and a, a certain rivalry developed, and what's sort of interesting is it happens now, you know, when I read uh, Glendale newspaper, I don't, or when I news from Glendale, it reminds me, uh, I, you know, I know there, was, there were uh, conflicts here between Armenian kids and Hispanic kids, right, in one of your high schools uh, recently. And it reminded me, in Fresno, that same thing, you know, the immigrant kids were against each other. And, and there it was the, the Armenian kids against the Germans who had come from Russia, the Russian German. Uh, who are also significant there. So it's interesting that these groups who are, are both insecure on the one hand and wondering what to do on the other are, are also uh, in conflict uh, with it. So uh, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if there's a, a lot of negative vibes when it comes to Armenian things here. Uh, and that's all the more reason that we should know who are these kids? Who are they? Uh, why are they here? And how did they get here? Uh, I, uh, in that city of Fresno, uh, prejudice was so pronounced in the 1930s and 1940s until World War II that any smart Armenian kid, as you have many right here, because I've seen them come through UCLA. You know, we, we, we often focus on the negative. The negative is frequently in the news, and the positive isn't. But these kids come through UCLA, smart, smart kids who emigrated here 10 years ago, 15 years ago, uh, especially the girls, I don't know why, but they much <laughs> harder working. Uh, you know, the boys sort of like to take it easy and play cards and things like that. Uh, but uh, smart kids coming through, uh, uh, through the system. Uh, but if it were Fresno in the 1930s and 1940s, and they're able, the few of them are able to go through and get into Fresno State, that wasn't so easy. Because most, there's a lot of pressure on kids, you know, our immigrant families have to work together to stay together. And uh, if you're uh, in the Great Depression of California, as we had in the 1930s, families, you know, my, my mother uh, 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 grew up going to school, smart girl, but she had to go to the canneries. You know what a cannery is? Where, you, where the fruit is, is processed and they make canned fruit and this and that. And all the army and young girls and women were on these canneries and packing figs and packing dried fruit and pitches and so forth. So everybody, the family had to <coughs> work together. But occasionally, uh, a young girl had the determination that she wanted to go to higher education. And if she did succeed in going to Fresno State, and uh, was the top of her class, uh, she could not be hired in the Fresno City Schools. There was a unspoken practice of excluding Armenians from becoming teachers in the Fresno City Schools. Just as there were covenants in property where you cannot sell, I mean, these are now all illegal, but in those days they weren't. You cannot, if you're, the, if you're going to buy a property, you are not allowed, it's in the document, 
uh, to sell to a Negro, an Oriental, that's what they're, you know, anyone that's from the Asia is an Oriental, uh, uh, to a Mexican or to an Armenian. And it's really ironic because when my parents moved from Tulare to Fresno, from Tulare to Fresno, much later when they were much older, and they bought a property, I helped them find it, across from what we call the Sunnyside Golf Course. You know, that's nice, golf course. We had a view of the golf course ac across from my parents' home. But the property deeds had in it that this property was not to be sold to various groups, including Armenians. So it shows, you know, uh, what, how deeply prejudice uh, can run. If, um, and when I come back to what I'm talking about, um, Sarah, and uh, how, how do we introduce this, I'm not sure, but I, uh, you may have heard of the writer, many people don't know him any longer, William Soroyan. Uh, William Soroyan was a, really a first-rate American writer, and um, he won a Pulitzer Prize uh, uh, for a book, The Human Comedy, dealing with World War II, but he also wrote a very small book, and I, I want to encourage you to try to find it, the name of which is My Name is Aram. Aram is an Armenian name, A-R-A-M. A-R-A-M, my name is Aram, or, you know, um, Americans would pronounce it Aram. Uh, my name is Aram. Uh, uh, my name is Aram, in which he depicts the life of an immigrant boy or the child of immigrants in the San Joaquin Valley. And it's really interesting because you get a strong, strong picture of uh, life of uh, uh, immigrant in the, in the valley, the vineyards, and many of the things that I uh, that I my, myself uh, grew up on. Uh, so uh, I think that we need to, um, and, and probably the Resource Center here can help us on that, to find works on uh, the Armenian genocide, the Armenian immigrant experience that would be appropriate to 10, 12, 13 year old youngsters. And I think that's really a challenge for us to find that literature, not to avoid it, not to exclude it, but to gradually move into it. And I don't have enough expertise myself. I haven't done much work in that, but there is, have to, has to be, and I know there is children's literature, like what was the story of, uh, 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 of someone's life? Uh, in, in the old country, what they did, how they did it, and so forth, and then what brought them uh, to America. All the children that you see in the Glendale, or almost all of them, Glendale, La, La Cañada, have come here um, not by choice, but there's been something in their history that has coerced them to leave the land where they had lived for 2,000, 3,000 years. Something happened. And, um, and that happening could have been as recently as 20 or 30 years ago. It could have been a civil war in Lebanon. It could have been a revolution in Iran where uh, minorities felt very insecure and where some minorities were persecuted and even individuals of those minorities executed. A fear of uh, religious domination that is not my religion. I mean, you've all now uh, have exposure to ISIS. You all know what the Islamic State was all about and think about living under that and if you're a parent, you probably want to get away and get your kids out of there into somewhere where you would consider to be uh, much safer. And so it was um, with the Armenians, so that they have been essentially being, having to move continuously 
to preserve themselves and their children and their children's future. Now, they can be very happy where they move. They can become very prosperous where they move. The hills of Glendale are filled with Armenian uh, uh, very lovely homes. Uh, uh, but it's not necessarily that it is by their own choice uh, that they got here. And so we want to, I think, if we're talking about sixth grade, fifth, sixth grade, um, social studies and emigration, to maybe look and see where, since we have so many Armenian kids now, uh, where are the countries from which these kids are coming? And um, why did their parents or grandparents feel the need uh, to leave a land which they really loved. Uh, well, we have a lot of Armenians from Iran right here in Los Angeles, and they love their memories of life as it was. They love the Persian foods that they cook in their homes and share with each other. Uh, they like even the Persian music. Uh, they may have one time sort of laughed at it, but now they love it. Uh, they love to dance to it, as do the Armenians from Lebanon, who used to sort of smirk when they played Arabic music, but love it now because they get up and start shaking around like, uh, like a good uh, Arab would. Uh, so this nostalgia, this is what we call nostalgia. Why do they have this nostalgia? Uh, and so forth. And so they're all thrown together here of people from various backgrounds who have share one thing, and that is the name of Armenian, with many, many subcultures. And, uh, you know, the more exposed to those subcultures you are, the more you know about them and, and are able to understand uh, what goes on. And the most recent, of course, and probably the most problematic for us in Glendale are the kids whose parents came from, maybe they even did, from what was the Soviet Union, from Soviet Armenia. Uh, they come from a different kind of culture from one from Iran or, or from Lebanon. They come from a different culture. Um, they lived in the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union um, had some good points. Uh, it exalted culture, and especially music. There's not a home you can go into in Armenia where someone doesn't play either the piano or the violin or the harmonica or something. So there, and the theater and so forth. So with all the cultural uh, richness that existed in the little state of Soviet Armenia, that existed from 1920-21 until 1990, those 70 years, uh, there, were, there were good things. They, they brought literacy to the country, they stressed education, but there are also bad things. Enormous internal corruption, uh, ideological pressure put on people, you had to learn things a particular way. Uh, economic uh, disparity to a degree that parents who were loving and wonderful parents and moral individuals generally, nonetheless had to steal. They stole from the state because the state ripped them off continuously. So they're going to steal back. And if you come to L.A., maybe some of them feel like, well, that's a rich country and nobody's going to notice. And I'm not just giving you the negative, but, you know, we have to understand the psychology. Who are these kids? Who are the kids in my class? And why, why maybe are they doing what they're doing the way they're doing? Why are they maybe fibbing and trying to get out of something? Uh, when, you know, otherwise they're really really um, uh, good kids. Well, I, uh, I was fortunate, I was fortunate. Um, 
I, I got over my identity crisis and I, I, I found out it's pretty good being something else besides uh, the good Anglo-American that I can be, uh, that I'm enriched by this additional dimension or dimensions, that I'm able to speak English probably as well as most other people. I might even be able to write as well as anyone else and therefore I don't need to be feel inferior. I don't need to feel inferior anymore. I might have at one time with my long last name and teachers stopping when they're going to pronounce it. But now I can see I can hold my own uh, in any kind of, well almost any kind of, of uh, environment and that the Armenian aspect of it gave me um, truly uh, an enrichment and broadening of horizon that I would never have and so I think that means that multiculturalism is not such a bad thing. It was in my time. Um, parents, Armenian parents in Fresno were terribly scolded by their teachers of their children if they were speaking Armenian at home saying this interferes with the learning process of your child. And they would, without even asking, change the name of Armenian children who had Armenian names. They would change them and anglify them. Uh, and so no wonder they felt inferior. You know, your, your language is bad, your name is bad, uh, and so forth. Well, we've, we've, gotten, we've gotten over that. And uh, I think we are, uh, at least on the surface, at least on the surface, embracing the fact that uh, exposure to numerous cultures is not a bad thing. And that's what's sad about so much of the world today. The intolerance of the other. Intolerance of the other. If you're not my religion, majority religion, if you're not the majority language, uh, you know, then uh, you're really second class. And that's really what happened to the Armenians in the Turkish Empire. Where even though they could be prosperous, even though they could become merchants, even though they could even, you know, make more income than maybe their Muslim neighbors, nevertheless, they remained throughout the history of the Ottoman Empire, today's Turkey, they remained second-class citizens by virtue of the fact that they were Christians. And as a Christian in a Muslim empire, like the Ottoman Empire was, you had to accept the fact that you're not equal. That was a trade-off, a trade-off. We'll let you practice your imperfect religion, even though, you know, there's only one perfect religion, <clears throat> in exchange for the fact that you will accept the fact that you are not equal with us, that you will pay special taxes, <clears throat> that we have various kinds of disabilities placed upon you, and these are both legal and um, traditional kinds of things. And, and we have that here in the United States. I, I can never forget, and I often bring up this example. Um, as I was growing up and uh, going to the university in Berkeley, I had my, my first trip to the East Coast on a train. And um, I took the Southern Pacific Railway to New Orleans. And in New Orleans, I had to change trains to go to Washington, D.C. Really exciting, you know, here I am, what was I, maybe 19 years old. <clears throat> My first trip out of California. <clears throat> Four hours in New Orleans to run around to the French market and various other places to get some provisions. And as I was uh, going to the, catch the next train after I'd run around 
New Orleans for a few hours. Uh, it was a, a getting dark, and but walking toward me um, was a Negro. And um, as he approached me, the Negro approached me, we called them Negroes, uh, he stepped down into the street, to the gutter, because the sidewalk was narrow, and he spotted a white boy, a fat white boy, walking toward him. And in order to avoid this moment of confrontation, he did sort of what was not in the law, books, but was what by tradition, he stepped down into the street <clears throat> to allow this boy to pass him. I'll never forget that. Allow him to pass, and then back on the street in order to avoid conflict or confrontation. And that was the same thing that Armenians did in the Ottoman Empire, and they still do, not wanting to be very visible, wanting to be invisible as much as possible. Uh, uh, not causing a situation in which it's a matter of who was here first. Hmm? But sure. And when you do that, you know, century after century, it also affects your psyche and who I am and uh, uh, how do I relate to other people. And, and so you can understand, therefore, this sense of cautiousness, of fear. You know, I talked about our means of Iran. They had a wonderful life. But they, t quite old. Uh, I didn't know why my father came to America. I mean, I knew in a general sense, Turks are bad, they're oppressive, uh, people had to leave, you know, this sort of essentializing, simplifying everything. But I didn't know his story, and you know, I didn't know it until um, I have this, if I don't fall. Um, my grandson wrote Family of Shadows. And um, Garin, uh, who graduated from, uh, I'm not going to fall, um, from Columbia School of Journalism, took it upon himself to do a study of the Hovhannessian family. And he looks at three generations, starting with my father, whose name was Kaspar, and of course in America he became Casper, Casper. Um, starting with Kaspar or Gaspar, and then uh, moving to me, the sort of in-between generation, the insecure generation, the searching generation, partially rejecting but still living that dual existence, and to our children's generation, my children's generation, who are now confident in who they are and who are now searching for answers that we can't give them anymore because we didn't ask the questions that we should have asked to my father. And only when Garin, my uh, grandson, um, wrote this book, and it's a good book, you should you know, read it and consider it, uh, did I learn that Kaspar was a 13-year-old boy in 1915. And you know, by now I'm sure that 1915 was the beginning of the end for the Armenian people in the Turkish Empire. Beginning of the end. Uh, because as Sarah has pointed out, in April of 1915, uh, the dictatorial regime that had taken over the Ottoman Empire uh, begun its plan of annihilation by arresting, imprisoning, exiling, and killing the heads, a large number of the heads of the Armenian community. Intellectuals, teachers, political leaders, writers, clergymen. You know, those are, you, 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 you destroy the body by cutting off the head. And so the beginning of the cutting off the head begins in 1915 in April, but it doesn't stop there. It starts. It starts. Um, 
when it starts, by the time it starts, uh, the Armenian young people, young men, have already been drafted into the Turkish army because Turkey went to war. Remember World War I? You remember the years? Anybody that's... What is it? No, not 12. 14 until what? 18, right. 14 to 18, uh, World War I, World War II, 41 to what? 45. 45 or 39 to 45, right. Um, so, uh, by, by the time World War I began, or shortly thereafter, all of the uh, eligible young Armenians had been taken into the army and drafted. That included my grandfather, uh, whose name was Hovanes, meaning John, Johannes. So Hovanes, uh, probably in his 30s, I don't know, I'm not even sure, was uh, taken away into the army, drafted with uh, thousands and thousands of other young men, and uh, rather than being trained as soldiers, they were put into labor battalions because they were Christians. And the Christians were not armed or taught how to fight. They were instead used as pack animals and road builders and things of that type. And nearly all of them perish, and if they didn't die from a hard labor of 12, 14, 16 hours a day, then you kill them at the end of it. When, the, when their usefulness was over, you just kill them. So we know, who knows what happened to Hovannes? Where he died, how he died, what happened? Who knows? But he died. So what does that leave? That leaves his wife, uh, Hernad or Helen. <clears throat> my father Kaspar, age 13, and he had a younger brother, about age two or three, his name was Gabriel. Uh, that leaves them sort of without any menfolk of any kind, older people and, and kids. And, and then the orders come, not only are we going to get rid of the intellectuals and priests and so forth, but we want to get rid of all these people because they are a potential threat to us in the future. So you take preemptive action against the threat that might arise in the future because of the fact that they are Christians and because of the fact that our enemies in Europe are Christians and, uh, and that they might want to have equality or autonomy or separate from us. So before that happens, let's get rid of them. <clears throat> and, um, well, we got rid of the leadership. Uh, and then the process of implementing the plan. You know, this had to be a major plan. How do you rid a country that extends about 800, 900 miles across and several hundred miles north to south. How do you rid them of communities that have been there you know, since before you even came? Before the Turks arrived, the Armenians had been living there in those lands, in their own kingdoms or in their own principalities. And, and that's why um, the Armenian genocide is really significant in that it really had never been tried on that scale before. There have you know, been massacres throughout history. Throughout history, it's not new. Murder is not new, massacres are not new. But in the modern age to take an entire people and think that you can root them out from wherever they are, from one end of the empire to another, that takes <coughs> some either extreme paranoia on your part, or extreme confidence, um, some kind of assurance that it's gonna, you can do it. <clears throat> it. It wasn't done perfectly. There was a lot of sloppiness to the procedure 
of eliminating the Armenians, but by and large, they succeeded. I mean, there were some Armenians who survived here and there, and some mayor or governor who was a good guy and tried to protect uh, you know, the, the small minority of Armenians in his town or, or village. <clears throat> But overall, it worked, and, and, and the procedure was to uh, arrest all the men and take them to the jail, and then at nighttime, march them out and, and kill them, that's all. You know, you rope them, what do you do when you rope people up, four of them on a stake, and you march them out to the closest meadow or river or wherever there is, and uh, then you use your axes, bayonets, and whatever else there is to kill them. So what are they doing? They're getting rid of the potential resistors. I mean, normally it's the men uh, who have some arms, it's the men who are trying to, uh, you know, are, who are responsible for their families. And so what does that do? That leaves the women folk, the elderly, and children in the villages. So my grandmother, Hegnar, without any preparation, like thousands of other women uh, uh, in her station, is thrust into the role of becoming head of household. And uh, <clears throat> one of the great tributes you have to give to the Armenian women, and probably women in any circumstance, because it happened many times after that, is they have to now become the leaders of the household and make terrible decisions. I mean, how do I, how do I decide what to do? Remember, we're traditional society. Uh, I will wager, well, I'm not going to wager, but I would guess that all of you have moved more than once in your lifetime. You're very few, well, maybe not. Maybe in Glendale you're here, I don't know. But am I wrong? Uh, how many of you are living in the house where you were born? Yeah. Exactly. Well, these people had lived in that house generation after generation after generation. And they had, the women had not been away outside their uh, sort of protected village more than uh, uh, three kilometers, four, two miles, three miles, five miles. The men might go to the market, and this, but women were home and protected. And there, there was an Armenian village, and they had their Armenian church and their Armenian school. So they were a minority within a big country, but in their own town, that's who they were. And now, now the women are thrust into a role. And then their orders come, prepare. You're going to be relocated. But where am I going to be relocated? Well, don't worry about it. You know, you'll go, you'll be all right, you'll come back. It's a temporary measure. Um, and you can imagine the great horror and you know, wailing and weeping and gnashing of teeth. What are, what's going to happen to us? And what do I do with all that I have in my house that we have collected for 500 years? Where am I going to put it? Who am I going to give it to? I can't carry it all with me. So you might give it away. They, your Muslim neighbors might buy it for uh, at five cents on a dollar or whatever, just to get enough, a, a few pieces of money to sew into your clothes. Hopefully, you can use it uh, uh, on the way. In Tulare, California, in 1941-1942, I was going to school with a boy known as Jimmy Ichinaga. Jimmy Ichinaga. They had a nice restaurant in downtown Tulare. We used to go to it. And suddenly, Jimmy Ichinaga parents were told that they would be rounded up and sent away from Tulare. And I remember how strange it was, because they first took the Japanese Americans and they put them into the fairgrounds of Tulare County Fairgrounds, and they put guards and barbed wire around the fairgrounds, and oh, I mean, Jimmy's my, my friend. And then they took Jimmy and his family and they shipped them off into Arizona or somewhere. And I could now really realize how traumatic that had to be for Jimmy, even when he came back. And one good thing, I suppose, about 
being a survivor is that you have empathy for others. You should have empathy for others. And I remember of our 15 Armenian families in Tulare, three or four of them had Japanese neighbors. And they took over their Japanese neighbors' farms and farmed them for them. Of course, they took the crops. But when the Japanese came back from internment, they returned their farms to them. And they really were, uh, have a very good feeling uh, about that. But what I want to say is this kind of inhumanity can happen everywhere. Uh, and uh, you have to be alert. But let me go back to Kaspar, and I don't know, tell me, uh, I'm, all right. Um, so, Helenar, Helen, Gabriel, and all the village of Basmashen in the center of Turkey were put on the marches toward the south. They didn't know where they were going. And in time, they found themselves being joined by streams and streams of deportees from other villages near them, everywhere. And so it could, uh, you know, if they, if they were a 800 or 1,000 people, it could become now 10,000 people marching. And they didn't know where. Uh, they call it a death march. It was a death march. It was a death march. Because all along the way, uh, looting, robbing, killing, raping occurred. And these caravans of 10,000 people then became 5,000, then became 3,000, then became 1,000. People like me wouldn't last more than one day, probably. You know, I'm, I don't have a terribly good uh, heart condition, and I would be gone. Uh, old grandmas uh, couldn't take it. It's, have you been in Fresno in the summer, anybody here? Do you know what the weather's like? Yeah. Okay. It's 100 degrees, 105 degrees. Imagine walking day after day in 105, 110. No water, very little water, no food. How long can it last? And so they dropped. They dropped and they dropped. And first my kind of people, then the very little ones, the babes. Uh, dehydration, dysentery, they couldn't take it. And then, and then every night where we camped, our encampment on the way to we didn't know where, to Inferno, would be raided by villagers. Many of them were Kurdish villagers, ignorant people, crude today, who are today now having, unfortunately, their own suffering at the hands of the Turkish regime. But the Kurds were encouraged to uh, uh, set upon the Armenians, and they they took away pretty girls. Oh, how many thousands of pretty girls who now became the grandmothers and great-grandmothers of a whole generation of Turks and Kurds who may or may not know their great-grandmother's story, just like I didn't know my father's story until it was late. And then, um, uh, uh, when those Kurds came, probably within a week or so of the marches, as they went around, they, they, they saw Kaspar. Kaspar was a boy of 13. It was sort of miraculous. He was in between. They could have taken him away and killed him with the men, but somehow they didn't. So he was still like a preteen or a young teenager. Uh, strapling, and the Kurds saw this kid. They're smart in that sense. Their Kurds are shepherds. They have goats, sheep, and other kinds of flocks. And so they, they said, hey, this kid can work for us. He can be a shepherd for us. And so they took Kaspar from the death marches. Uh, and there was weeping and wailing, his mother, um, uh, his little brother, uh, none of whom, neither of whom he was ever going to see again, along with all his villagers, uh, went on their death march. 
And he was saved not by any humanitarian sentiment or altruism. You know, altruism is the word we use when you do something good without expectation of reward. It wasn't for altruism, but in this sense, it was an intervention. And the intervention was taking a boy away from the caravan of death and unwittingly allowing that boy to live, even though he was beaten and, and given a very bad time, nonetheless he w survived when the rest of his family went to their death. We only found out what happened to those rest of his villagers in the uh, 1920s and 1930s when a few of the women who had been, and, and those women would have been your age or even younger, uh, girls married early in traditional society. They may have, may have been mothers by the time they were 17 or 18. And um, they were the ones that were um, the only ones that would be your generation uh, that could have survived such horrors long enough to still be alive after six months. You know, I'm gone. Uh, the old people are gone, the young people are gone. Uh, the pretty girls have been plucked away, but there's still maybe enough of you that you might reach down to a place where the Tigris and Euphrates, where ISIS is operating today. That's where you would have reached a desert land with no provisions. And there you would also die, but I suppose the fortunate among you would have found someone that would take you away. And in this case, they were the tribesmen referred to as Bedouins. The Bedouins are nomads who sort of go over the desert. And Bedouins saw army and girls. They rescued some of them, and some of them just took them in as concubines or second and third wives. But again, you know, serendipity, they survived because they were taken in by these Arab tribesmen. But these tribes, interestingly, um, had a practice of tattooing their women. Uh, and they could be, you know, these uh, curlicues, what do you call these? Medallions. Medallions on their faces, on their lips. So when I grew up in Tulare and would visit some friends, I would see some of these women who had been rescued later by the American missionary New Near East Relief. And they had then been reunited with their families in California. But I always was sort of afraid of them. Uh, you know, tattooing was not an in thing in the 1920s and 30s. And there was no way to get rid of it. It was permanent. And so it was like a, a brand. And when, you, when they had those tattoos, everybody knew that they had been used. And it was sort of good when you think about it, again, traditional society, that the Armenian men didn't hold it against them. They married these women and they had new families with these women. But still, I remember those women with these tattoos, lips all over blue and, and here uh, the, in the San Joaquin Valley. And yet it really wasn't my story. Uh, you know, you get a knee-jerk reaction when you hear the word Turk. If you're an Armenian and you hear Turk, you have a knee-jerk reaction, even though, you know, wonderful Turks uh, well, people are people of different kinds, and we have to recognize the fact that many Turks really were miserable about what their government was doing. Many more took advantage of what their government was doing. As with the Kurds, some actually protected Armenians. Many more victimized them, but so individuals, you know. And there are, in any genocide, in any genocide, there are what are referred to as negative and positive incentives to participate. And a positive incentive to participate in violence, and we see it right here in any riot. What do they do? 
They smash the windows and carry radios away, don't they? So, and everyone else is doing it, so why shouldn't I do it? Why shouldn't I have something? So I'll take a television, I'll take a radio. That's okay. It's a, you know. And the same thing is in genocide, is that, look, everybody's getting something, why can't I have something? So I'll take my neighbor's cow, I'll take this and that, I'll take the little, uh, my wife's mother's six-month-old twin uh, siblings carried away uh, by, you know, everybody's taking something. Everybody's taking away something. Uh, uh, and that, that's what genocide um, is about. And so Casper was able, after two years, to run away uh, to uh, where the Russian armies were, on the other side of the front. And somehow, and somehow he got to, back to the Ottoman capital, Constantinople, it's known as Istanbul today. And I think a distant relative was able to get him like $25 through the Near East Relief or the American uh, officials there that allowed him to get onto steerage. You know what steerage is? And, 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 and steerage is you, you're on top, the top deck. You lie out and exposed under the sky for three weeks as you're crossing the Atlantic Ocean. And so under steerage, he was able to get to a New York, Ellis Island in 1920. Uh, you know, penniless, not knowing the language. But it's interesting that when he was getting on the ship, apparently it was American officials. Uh, I used to think it was at Ellis Island, but now I'm realizing it. It probably happened when he got on the ship. They asked him what his how he wanted his name to be recorded. And um, our family name was different. It was something else. Started with a G. And he thought for a moment and he remembered his father who had been taken away to the army, never to return. And his father's name was John Johannes Hovanes. And that's why I'm today Hovanesian because my father decided to take his father's first name as a sign of respect, uh, remembering his father. And that's why my, uh, my generation now, or my family, is known as uh, Hovanesian. And coming, to, um, uh, coming ultimately to um, California and starting a new life. And one thing we also need to realize is Survivors are really tough people um, in many ways. Survivors can be very strict toward their children. My, my father was very strict, you know. But on the outside, he was a happy-go-lucky person, uh, hospitable. Our house was always filled with people. The table was always filled. I mean, when you think back on it, these are the days when we had ice boxes. You know what an ice box is? Where you put a, go get 50 pounds of ice and stick it in. You don't have a refrigerator. You have an ice box. And why is it that my mother in two hours was able to put the table out for un uninvited or unexpected guests for 10, 12? They did it, they're all prepared. They had all these preserves ready down in the basement. You go up and you bring them up and, and, and the table's there. So they, and they knew how to, they, they knew how to um, enjoy life again. I mean, I think about it myself. Could I have, if I had lost my wife and my children, or my husband and my children, could I just 10 or 15 years later smile again? Could I again welcome people into my home? Could I sing songs uh, around the table? Could I even dance on, not birthdays, because Armenians didn't celebrate birthdays, but on name days, the name of the saint for whom you are uh, named yourself. 
So, you know, my father was Caspar, and then Caspar was one of the wise men, and his little brother Gabriel, you know. So, and so in, those, in those days, they're sort of interesting, they don't do it much anymore. On a name day, we would go to that person, whoever he was, St. Sarkis or something, with a candle lit, and we would go into that person's home, and there would be uh, an evening of uh, a, a good time, evening where people did sing and they did dance. And they did this all within one generation after, because they wanted to live. And then when that was gone, my father could again be that very strict uh, man who, you know, never was satisfied with, uh, you, you didn't do enough, uh, you know, or, or you, you didn't work hard enough, or, or whatever it may be. But they were survivors, uh, they, they were survivors. Um, so, uh, this book goes on, of course, with my generation, which tried to distance ourselves from their experience. That's why I didn't know his story until the very last year of his life when I interviewed him on a tape recorder, the last year of his life. And then my grandson took that recording and embellished it by going, doing research and finding people whom my father knew for years and years and was able. And then, you know, my story, who person who was sort of born again, um, a person who uh, couldn't read or write Armenian, could speak only a kitchen Armenian, uh, having, uh, having the drive to learn the language, uh, to be fortunate enough to become a pioneering professor in Armenian at a university level. But this generation does it. It's willing to go into the streets, it's willing to shout slogans and do things of that type because they have that confidence and that drive and they believe that there is a wrong that still has to be righted. And um, so I think all of these things um, are, are sort of grabbing points for you. Uh, I hope you will follow up on them. Look into what is an appropriate kind of literature that might be used for the kids at your age without making them have nightmares. And there are ways of doing that by just, you know, my childhood, my story, and so forth, and uh, uh, trying to understand uh, some of the strange behaviors of my students at times. Uh, and, and if we're going to look at geography, wouldn't it be nice if we asked where people were from and then go back to those countries from which they came and pick up points of, you know, what, what was life like in this place and that place, and uh, how did we get here? Uh, and uh, make them comfortable with their strange names and uh, uh, maybe uh, to appreciate the dual existence that they have that they may not realize at this time. And so you're the leaders and you're the teachers and uh, I look forward to your going forward. Thank you. Uh, thank you.